Well, once again, I just want to say good morning to uh, my favorite church in uh, Turner, Montana. And I appreciate Doug Dury here at the Ord Christian Church taking time this morning to help us with the recording. A lot of people ask how the company I'm working for is doing. I'm on the road a lot. In fact, I leave today and I'll end up in Houston, Texas. And then I get back and uh, we're going to head to Montana for uh, Kayla's wedding. But one of the things I enjoy when I travel is I get to see a lot of different things. And Susie and I were just recently in Branson, Missouri, and we met a young couple after church. And Susie leaned over and said, who does this guy remind you of? And I said, he reminds me of somebody. And she said, Christy Bob. As soon as she said it, I knew exactly who she was talking about. This guy was just so much like Christy Bob, not quite as good looking as he was, but his mannerisms and everything. So Christy Bob has a twin down in Branson, Missouri. We left Branson and went to Dallas, and we kind of hit the corner of Arkansas. And we're driving through Arkansas, and I saw this young kid along the side of the road, and he only had one shoe. So we backed up, and I said, uh, did you lose a shoe? And this young boy from Arkansas smiled and said, no, I found one. Now that story's not completely true, but that's kind of the people that I run across quite often. If you have your Bibles this morning, I want to take you to Luke chapter 15. You know, we know 1 Corinthians 13 is the love chapter. John 17 is the unity chapter. Luke 15 would really be the lost chapter. A guy by the name of Gary Burgess said that Jesus lived in a storytelling world and was well known for his storytelling ability. We love to be around people that tell stories. Uh, you know, I, I see people all the time that they think they are cowboy poets, but no one has ever come close to being like Fred Lees. Uh, I've never been around someone who can tell a story and weave a tale like Fred. In fact, when I was back living in Haver and I'd do funerals and I knew that Fred was going to be sharing at the funeral, I would tell Marvin Edwards, don't make me follow Fred Lees. I want to be first, let him be the one to kind of wrap it up because I just never wanted to follow him. But Jesus was a storytelling master. He would tell parables. Martin Luther described this chapter as the gospel within the gospel. He said this is the good news in its purest form. He might even call it the gospel undiluted. And when you think about it, as Jesus is sharing these stories, Jesus is painting a portrait of his Father for us. If anybody knew the heart of God, it was Jesus. Jesus painted the portrait through the interaction of a shepherd and his actions toward a lost sheep, through the feelings of a woman and her actions towards a lost coin, and then we're going to take a look at how Jesus conveyed the Father and how he related this to his son. And one of the reasons why Jesus would use parables, it's almost like the punchline of a joke. You get into this parable and you think it's going to end one way, and Jesus would have it end an entirely different way. It's kind of like the story of the man who was at the breakfast nook. He's reading the morning paper. His wife comes down the stairs. She's got her hair in curlers, big fuzzy slippers on. Guess what? says, what? I had a dream. Somebody very special presented me with a pearl necklace. She said to her husband, what do you make of that? The husband kind of smiled and said, you just wait. See what happens this evening. So that night, he brought home a gift. She opened it up, and here was a book on how to interpret dreams. That's not how that story is supposed to end. That's how a parable oftentimes would be. We're in Luke chapter 15. This is the heart of the travel narrative of Luke. Jesus is going up to Jerusalem. In Luke chapter 14, Jesus has just taught one of the toughest teachings. He says, unless you're willing to give up everything. And then he says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. So you and I need to once again remember the context of Luke chapter 15. Uh, at least once a year I like to preach on this because it really is one of my favorite chapters. 
In Luke chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, it says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear him. You've heard me say before that this could just be the people of the land. They weren't Mr. Good Wrench. They weren't Mr. Bad Wrench. They're just Mr. Wrench. They were the ones who didn't give a rip about what the Sadducees and the Pharisees had to say. Kind of like a lot of our neighbors. Good people give you the shirt off their back, but they just uh, really didn't care what the Sadducees and Pharisees had to say. But they were gathering around to listen to what Jesus had to say. Then in verse 2, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and he eats with them. Mark Moore, who is one of my favorite uh, authors, preachers, he says, I think I can make a pretty strong argument that Jesus died because of the people he went to the, that he ate with. That's the reason he went to the cross. And if you look through the life of Jesus, you'll notice that probably half the time he ate with the down and out, but the other half he kind of ate with the upper crust. People like Nicodemus and the wealthy. And then Jesus told them this parable. Now I want you to notice it's parable singular. People will say to me, is it three stories, is it three parables, or is it one? The answer is yes. Jesus told three stories, and the one we're going to end up with here today is the one where it's really the climax of the three. It's like the first two are leading up to the third. And in the first story, it says, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep. This is a very wealthy individual. Because back in these days, if you had 25 to 30 sheep, that was a large band of sheep. If you had 100, that meant you were pretty wealthy. Does he leave the 99 in the open country? Now, most of us would say, no, you don't. You, you cut your losses. You, you know you're going to lose one sheep every now and then. But I think that Jesus is trying to explain the extravagant love of the Father. And you and I remember the rest of the story he went and found the lost sheep. He came back, and it says he rejoiced. That's really the theme as you and I go through Luke chapter 15. He rejoices at the finding of the lost sheep. They rejoice at the finding of the lost coin. But what I want to take a look at is beginning with verse 11, the parable of the lost son. And once again, the phrase rejoicing is found more often in Luke 15 than in any other chapter. Because once again, I think Jesus is trying to explain the heart of the Father. Jesus continued, there's a man who had two sons. Keep this in mind. This is a story about two sons. The younger one said to the father, and, and once again, this is not how you would start a parable. This is not how you'd start a story in the days of Jesus. You would always start with the older son. And we're going to find out that really the older son is the point of this parable. But the younger one said to his father, Father, give me the share of my estate. Uh, one of my, once again, an author I read a lot is a guy by the name of Kenneth Bailey. And Kenneth Bailey lived with the Badean shepherds. And they basically are living life the same way that they did when the time of Jesus. Kenneth Bailey talked about how he would read this parable and the reaction would all be the same. There would be just this constant, ah, this would never happen in this culture. For a young son to come to his father and say, give me my share of the estate, that's like the son is saying, dad, I, I wish you were dead. And then he says, so he divided his property between them, both the older son and the younger son. He divided the estate early. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth and wild living. He had to take everything that the father gave him, which would be the sheep, the gold, everything. He would take it to the bank, if you will, and came up with the money to go to a foreign country. And the rest of the story goes on that how the, the younger son squandered everything that the father had given him. And I want to pick up the story, and I want to 
take a look at begin with verse 25 because this is what I want to key in on today. I want to key in on the older son because I really think that's the point of this parable. Keep in mind, you got to go back to verses 1 and 2. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and he eats with them. Jesus is driving home the point to the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Verse 25. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. The older son is doing everything that the father has asked him to do. But he comes back, so he called one of the servants and asked him, What's going on? He says, Your father has come, he replied. Your brother has come, excuse me, he replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has come, he has have him back safe and sound. You remember when the father brought the younger son home, he did a couple of things that were pretty unique. First of all, he put the signet ring on his hand. That's like giving someone a checkbook. The signet ring says that everything I have belongs to you. If you need to buy something, you just take my signet ring and buy it. He put sandals on the younger son's feet. Sandals were for those who were part of the household. Remember, the younger son came home and he just simply wanted to be a slave. And the father said, no, I want you to be my son. And then he gave him the robe, the best robe, probably the father's robe. There's only one best robe. And then the final thing he did was he killed the fatted calf. This would be the purple ribbon calf at the Blaine County Fair. This is the calf that you saved for a special event. And the father is saying that I'm welcoming my son home. Now keep in mind, Jesus knows the heart of the father. And he's saying, no matter what you've done, I'm going to welcome you home. When the older brother saw this and says, your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound, you would think that the older brother would be rejoicing and that the older brother would be welcoming. But it says the older brother became angry and he refused to go in. Now, once again, a couple of things that you and I may not understand because we're not in this culture. Back in this day, if you were the older son, you would be the one that would be required to be the host at the party. The father would be sitting at the head table. You as the older son, you would go around and you would make sure that everybody felt welcome. And the other thing, if you were the older brother, if there was someone who was the guest of honor, it was your job to put your arm around him. It was your job to make sure that his wine glass was always full. It was your job to go and make sure that he mingled with everybody in the room. And the older brother is angry. He's angry about the son, so the father has to come out. This is the second time the father has to come out. The first time he's on the porch, he sees the younger son coming. It says that he runs to greet the younger son. The older son is not coming out or coming into the party, so the father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, and he said, look. And once again, this would not be the reaction that a first century son would give. This would not be the time when the older son would say, hey, listen to me. You look at me, father. And everybody in the room would have been aghast as Jesus shared this. All these years I've been slaving for you, and I've never disobeyed your orders. How many times have we in the church, we've seen people come to the church and we think, wow, what are they doing here? I've been the one that's been going to church all my life. I've been the one that's gone to vacation Bible school all my life. I've been the one that kept the law. Did he really? Did he really always obey his father? I heard the story of the preacher who got up on Sunday morning and he was preaching on sin And a lady came out, and she said to the preacher, boy, it's a good thing you're preaching on sin. Everybody else really needed to hear that. And the preacher said, well, don't you think you needed to? No. He said, well, 
I needed to. And the lady said, preacher, I haven't sinned in 30 years. And the preacher said, you keep this up for three more years and you'll tie the record. You'll probably get that on the way home. He said, look, Father, all these years I've been slaving for you and have never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. And you know the father has to be thinking, wait a minute. Everybody in town is here. I've killed the fatted calf. Aren't my friends your friends? Aren't the people that I hang out with, the people that you would consider friends? If these are not, if my friends are not your friends, then who are your friends? <clears throat> but when the son of yours who has squandered your, prospect, your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him doesn't say that the younger son spent time with the prostitutes. This is something the older son interjects on his own. In 31, it says, My son, the father said, You are always with me, and everything I have is yours. <clears throat> this is why the parable starts off and says he has two sons. And the older son comes home. And it would have been very easy for the father to have looked at the older son and, and said, hey, you listen here. I'm going to treat you like a servant. <clears throat> but he didn't. He said, my son, you are always with me. And everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad. Because this brother of yours was dead, he's alive again, he was lost, and now he's found. The reason I like to just focus in on the fact that it's talking about the older son, because <clears throat> really that's, that's who I am. Uh, one of my favorite preachers, Mark Scott, always asks the question, who is it? that you are, or where do you find yourself in the parable? Uh, most of us that are here, we, we would fall into the category of the older brother. We haven't gone off to a far country. We, we don't have that testimony that a lot of people want to listen to. We, we just grew up going to church, going to vacation Bible school, going to camp. But the, but the question I want to pose here this morning is, what is our attitude towards those who are lost? What is our attitude towards those who've wandered away? And I think that Jesus is really trying to say here this morning in this parable that there are two types of sinners. There's the, the sinners that are the boring sinners, and then there are the sinners who are the spectacular sinners. And to be honest with you, I would probably fall into that category of being the boring sinner. My testimony, most of you know it. But I want to ask myself the question, what am I doing to reach out to those who are lost? Do I raise my eyebrows? Do I spend my time in prayer for them? And once again, the point of this parable is Jesus is reaching out to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, and he mutters, this man welcomes sinners, and he eats with them. And I just want to remind you once again, Jesus not only loved these people, but he liked them. That, that's what being a friend of sinners meant. Jesus would sit down at a table and he would laugh with them and eat with them. And the whole point of that was to tell people about who God really was. You know, we just came through Memorial Day and I ran across this story that took place on D-Day. 
And you remember, if you have any history recollection at all, there's on D-Day that there's over a thousand men who parachuted into the darkness, and when their boots hit the ground, uh, they knew they had to fight. But there's a couple guys who didn't shoot. Uh, they were medics trained to be doctors. And they started tending the wounds of men all around them. And they found that the only place of refuge was this little church called Angleville a Plain in France. It was a 900-year-old chapel, and they turned it into a makeshift ER. For 36 hours, without sleep, around the clock, they tended to men, American or German. Anybody who was brought in, they tended, they helped, because they wanted them to have another shot at life. And after a few days, these two medics were credited with saving 80 lives, 80 men and one little girl. And when the church finally opened back up and the people came back, they were shocked to see the seats were stained with blood. The seats, the backs, they were livid. And then they were told why this was true. They were told what these two medics had done, even for total strangers. And then the people in that church made a wise decision. We're not going to clean the pews off. And if you're to go over there today, you'll see the pews are still stained with blood. You visit that church, and the pews, the backs are covered. It's a visual reminder. Every Sunday when the people come in, that the church is to be a hospital for the wounded. Because the most important leader shed his blood for you and me. And it's a reminder to me as I read through Luke chapter 15, when I have a tendency to become judgmental, when I have a tendency to become more like the older brother, I begin to realize that there's just a lot of people who've never been introduced to the grace of God. And like Philip Yancey said, there's nothing you can do to make God love you more. There's nothing you can do to make God love you less. That's God's amazing grace. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're grateful for this day. And I just thank you, God, for the lessons that we learned in Luke chapter 15. Father God, I pray that I never have the attitude of the older brother. I pray, Father, that I will understand that God's grace has been good to me, and I need to show that same grace to others. I pray this, Father, in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.